Hello and welcome to Electromagnetics 1. This is uh, lecture number 12. This will be our first lecture discussing uh, magnetostatics and magnetostatic fields. Uh, today's lecture will cover primarily uh, the Biosavar law. Well, by way of introduction here, I'd like you to think a little bit about um, what we've just done in uh, electrostatics. Uh, recall that an electrostatic field described by the electric field E is created by uh, stationary charges. So if uh, somewhere out there in space you have a group of charges that don't move, um, you will have an associated uh, electric field that those charges create. However, if the charges move with a constant velocity, which corresponds to a direct current, a magnetostatic field described by the magnetic field H is produced in that region of space. Um, the constant current uh, may be due to magnetization currents, as in permanent magnets. Um, it may be due to electron beam currents in vacuum tubes or just simply conduction currents um, in a wire. So there are a wide variety of situations um, that you may encounter where a magnet magnetic field exists. Let's uh, make a brief comparison here of electrostatics and uh, magnetostatics. Um, in the time invariant case, the electric and magnetic fields decouple. Um, if you have a look here uh, at this box, we have the equations of electrostatics that we've just gotten done um, studying. Uh, the first one is that the curl of the electric field is equal to zero. And uh, the divergence here of the um, electric flux density D, or uh, simplified here as epsilon E, is equal to the um, uh, charge density, essentially, the volume volumetric uh, charge density in a region of space. We studied uh, these uh, two equations in electrostatics. The takeaway here is that the electric field is produced by electric charges only, stationary electric charges in the electrostatic case. Um, however, when we go to the magneto, meto, magnetostatic case and we allow the uh, charges to start to move such that we have currents, uh, the two Maxwell's equations that are relevant are, are this one and this one. Uh, the first one says that the curl of the magnetic field is equal to the electric current density here and that the divergence of um, the magnetic flux density B or here um, mu the permeability times the magnetic field H is equal to zero. So um, the, the, the two pairs of equations are, are clearly similar here. Um, you have a curl equation and a divergence equation in each case. However, um, in the uh, magnetostatic case, the curl of the relevant field, in this case of the magnetic field, is not equal to zero. Rather, it's equal to the, um, uh, the electric current. Um, and that's going to uh, change the physics just a little bit. And we'll see how that works here uh, momentarily. And similarly, um, for the magnetic field, the divergence is equal to zero. It's not equal to as it was for the electric field. Um, equal to some point charges, it's just simply equal to zero. Uh, the takeaway for the magnetostatic case is that the magnetostatic field is produced by electric currents only. Well, given a DC current flowing in a wire, uh, if the wire has a particular shape, how do we calculate the magnetic field um, H? That's a, a pretty practical problem, really. You have a wire, it's got some current uh, flowing in it, the wire has a particular shape, and we would like to know, okay, what is the magnetic field created by this wire at every point in space? Uh, the answer to that question is, is uh, stated by uh, the Biosavar law, which says that the differential magnetic field intensity dH produced at a point P, as shown in the figure at the right. So, um, we've got a uh, little differential magnetic field here um, that's being produced at a point P, okay? And the Biosavar law says that this differential um, magnetic field produced at P by a differential current element, IDL, here, 
here's the um, this is the little differential current uh, length here DL and then a differential current element would be IDL and so this little um, differential current element produces at a point P a differential magnetic field DH okay so this differential magnetic field DH at a point P produced by this differential current element um, is proportional to the product IDL and the sine of the angle alpha here between the element and the line joining P to the element okay and it is inversely proportional to the square of the distance R uh, between P and the element and all of that um, is summarized here algebraically so we have DH is IDL cross R hat divided by 4 pi r uh, squared. So you can see that, um, so you can see some important physics here right away, which is that um, obviously the magnetic field is, is a vector again, so it's going to have a particular direction. In this case, um, the magnetic field is uh, noted to be into the board, that the cross there um, indicates into the board. A dot would mean pointing um, out of the board, I should say, or out of the page. Um, another important piece of physics is to note that um, the direction that this magnetic field is pointing is determined by a cross product here. All right, so you have to take a cross product between DL, this little differential uh, length here, and um, a line connecting that differential length to the point at which you would like to know the magnetic field, in this case P. So um, remember, when you do your cross product, uh, you put your fingers, uh, the fingers of your right hand in the direction of the first vector IDL, and you sweep it into um, the second vector R. And in that case, when you do that, um, your thumb will be pointing, should be pointing into the page. OK, well, there are other kinds of sources other than simply filamentary line sources like we saw on the line in the last um, slide that produce magnetic fields. So um, how do we deal with that? And uh, there are generalizations of Biosavar law, Biosavar's law um, depending on the kind of source distribution that you have. So if you have a filamentary line current like this that exists somewhere in space, you can calculate the magnetic field by simply adding up over that line all of the little differential um, magnetic field uh, components which is to say each little differential current element all the way along this line contributes some little differential magnetic field at this point and the total magnetic field there is the sum of the magnetic fields created by each of those little differential current elements all the way along the length of the line so you can see here, um, if you want to know the magnetic field generated by a line current, you have to do a line integral along the source, okay, along the filamentary um, current. If you want to know the magnetic field created by a surface current, and this has dim dimensions amps uh, per meter. If you want to know uh, what the magnetic field due to surface current is, you have to use this form of Biosavar's law right here, K, surface current, times ds cross r hat divided by 4 pi r squared. Again, the magnet magnitude of the field goes down as 1 over r squared. So the farther you get away, obviously, the weaker uh, the contribution to the field at that point is. Similarly, if you have a volume current um, that has units amps per meter squared, you're going to have um, a, a magnetic field that's created by this uh, current distribution also. And here you have to integrate over a volume. So the form of Biosavar's law that you need to use is determined by the geometry. Let's look at a couple of examples here uh, so that to help us understand concretely in, in practice how we would actually um, find the magnetic field due to a particular um, kind of current distribution. 
Let's first look at the magnetic field due to a finite uh, line current. So um, this is a figure from Sadaku. And what it's showing here very simply is um, a straight filamentary uh, current that exists from a point A to a point B. And it's aligned here uh, for convenience along the Z axis, right? Well, how do we approach figuring out um, what uh, this current distribution is going to contribute to the magnetic field? Or I should say, uh, how are we going to find the magnetic field produced by uh, this uh, particular current distribution anywhere in space? How do we approach that? Well, the first place to start is um, our differential form here of the Biosavar law. dH is I dL cross R hat divided by 4 pi R squared. Uh, the game is to identify, in terms of some coordinate system, dL and R hat, okay? um, or equivalently dL and, and R. Uh, the coordinate system that we're going to use here is, is the cylindrical coordinate system. Um, that's because this geometry has a cylindrical symmetry. You can see that it's, there's, you have axial symmetry. It doesn't really matter where you are as you rotate around this object. It looks the same, basically, um, from all of those vantage points. And so um, we should expect that, just from looking at symmetry here, we should, spec we should expect that the magnetic field will not be a function of phi, okay? It will not be a function of the azimuthal angle. However, we should expect that it will be a function of rho, the distance uh, radially away from the line, and probably also it should be a function of z uh, because the line is finite in extent. Let's see if that's borne out by our calculations. Well, how do we figure out an expression for dl, this little differential length um, that occurs on the source, remember? Well, this thing, again, it's a, it's a line current aligned with the z-axis, so dl is just simply dz in the z-hat direction. Remember, it's a, it's a vector, carries magnitude and, uh, and a direction. Let's see if we can figure out what r is. Now remember, r is a vector that points from uh, the differential length on the source to your observation point P. Remember, the observation point P is the point at which you want to know the strength uh, and the magnitude, I should say the magnitude and the direction of the magnetic field, okay? The point where you're evaluating the field, essentially, the field point, okay? All right, well, the coordinates of P here um, are simply rho, rho hat um, zero, essentially. So in this case, R is just simply equal to rho, rho hat little r, I should say, is just equal to rho, rho hat. r prime is, again, a vector that points from the origin to a particular point on the object. That is, in this, uh, for this geometry, that is simply equal to z, uh, z hat. And capital R here is r minus r prime, so r is rho, rho hat r prime is z, z hat, and so the difference is rho, rho hat minus z, z hat. That's capital R, this vector for this particular geometry. And it depends on um, where you are in the, the height of the, at which you are on the object. The, in other words, the z coordinate appears here in this r. That makes sense. This vector is longer at that point than it is at this point. Okay, now we need to figure out um, the next term in this equation, which is dl cross r hat, all right? Well, um, this one you can sort of do in your head, but in general, what you want to do is um, look up the expressions for the cross product in the coordinate system in which you are working. So, for instance, in this particular uh, example, we are working in the cylindrical coordinate system. So I would look up the expression for the cross product in cylindrical coordinates, and I would take that uh, cross product. You can sort of um, just, just look at this figure and see what it's going to be. Um, if you take dl, which is in the z direction, and cross it into a vector that has um, a component only in rho and in z, um, 
z hat cross z hat will be zero and so you just end up with z hat cross rho hat um, which is equal to uh, phi hat so uh, dl cross r in this case will be um, rho times dz in the phi hat direction uh, that's z hat cross uh, phi hat all right so we filled in this part right here, um, dl cross r. We found out that's rho dz times phi hat. So we can put that in our expression, all right? <clears throat> the next thing we need to do is uh, then integrate, integrate over this entire uh, source distribution in order to find the total magnetic field. So if this is a differential magnetic field, dh, created by a single um, current element, we need to know what is the magnetic field created by all of the current elements along the geometry, on, on, the, on the geometry, on the structure. In order to do that, we integrate um, uh, the z coordinate here from A to B, from that point to that point. And we, we're integrating this expression. So I dl cross R is equal to this expression, rho dz in the phi hat direction divided by four pi. And uh, since capital R is uh, rho squared plus z squared to the one half power, then um, uh, our, uh, when we uh, calculate um, r hat here, we're gonna have to go back and uh, rethink about this as um, the r vector divided by r to the third, actually. So over here, what you're gonna see, remember um, this, the definition of, of capital R hat is equal to capital R divided by its magnitude, all right? So when uh, we actually, practically speaking, use this expression here, we're gonna replace this with um, r, this capital R vector here, and we're gonna add another factor of uh, the magnitude uh, to the denominator. So we could rewrite this as dl cross capital R here divided by four pi r to the third. So because capital R is equal to rho squared plus z squared to the one half, uh, capital R to the third is equal to rho squared plus z squared to the three halves power. That's where that's all coming from there, all right? Okay, now we have to somehow um, compute this integral. Um, in order to do this integral, we need to use a trigonometric uh, substitution from, from calculus. And uh, <coughs> the substitution that you wanna make here is the following. You're gonna let z be equal to rho times cotan cotangent of alpha. Um, that corresponds to dz equals minus cosecant squared alpha d alpha. And similarly, you're gonna let this quantity here in the denominator um, be equal to rho to the third, cosecant to the third uh, power of alpha, okay? When you make all those substitutions in here, this integral is transformed into this integral. And um, if you'll notice, uh, we're integrating over alpha here now, so the integration has gone from over z to over alpha. And uh, this is right here, the angle that this R, alpha is the angle that R, this capital R vector makes with um, the filamentary current element. That's what alpha is. Anyhow, um, when you plug all this stuff in here, um, the only thing that survives is uh, one over rho term there and a um, one over cosecant alpha term, which is equal to uh, sine of alpha right here. And happily, happily, um, sine of alpha is, is, an is an easy integral to compute. So um, doing the antiderivative there, um, you get uh, minus cosine and evaluate, <coughs> evaluate it at the limits, you end up with this expression uh, right here. So the magnetic field due to this finite current um, element is given by this expression right here. Very interestingly, it falls off as one over rho. So the farther you get away in this direction, the weaker the field is, and, and the weakness is described by um, one over rho. 
And it also depends on the cosine of these uh, starting and beginning angles here, alpha one and alpha two. And it, it always points in the phi hat direction. So remember, um, in cylindrical coordinates, uh, the phi hat vector points in a different direction depending on what value of phi that you are at, right? So um, if you're at phi equals zero, um, uh, the, phi direct, the phi hat vector points in a different direction than it does at phi equals pi over pi over two or phi equals pi or three pi over two, et cetera, et cetera. So make sure that you understand when you're working through this what this phi hat symbol here means. It, it points in different directions depending on where you are in, in phi. Okay, let's look at another example here. This is a, also sort of a classical example that people look at. Um, and what we would like to know is what is the magnetic field due to a circular loop current? And uh, we're not going to determine what that magnetic field is at any point in space. In this case, that's a little bit too hard. So what we're going to do is we're just going to figure out, okay, what is the magnetic field at a point along the axis of the loop here? So just at a point at some height right here above the loop. Again, um, the choice of the co coordinate system is key to being able to actually deal with any of these problems. So um, if you look in, in this case, what we're, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be using, again, the cylindrical coordinate system because for two reasons. First of all, um, you've got a circle here. So that suggests basically either the cylindrical or spherical uh, coordinate system. Uh, in this case, there's really no reason um, not to use cylindrical because we're interested in a point along uh, the Z coordinate, which is unique to uh, the cylindrical coordinate system. So uh, we need, uh, we need, we're going to use cylindrical in this case. All right. The process uh, is very similar to the one that we went through uh, for the finite um, straight line current. We're going to start with this expression right here. dH is I dL cross R hat over 4 pi R capital R squared or equivalently dH is I dL cross R capital R divided by four pi capital R to the third. Okay, either, either way, it's, they're, they're equivalent. And we're gonna have to figure out what each of these terms is, assemble them, and then integrate. Okay, let's see, what's DL in this case? Remember, DL is a differential length along the current distribution. And um, we have a circle here, a circular current distribution. So, uh, our uh, differential length is going to depend on the radius here, rho, of our circle, all right? And it's always going to be pointing in the phi hat direction, right? Here, phi hat points this way, then it points that way, then it points that way. It's always tangential to that circle, right? So um, the length of that little differential uh, uh, length there is equal to rho times d phi, all right, that's the, that's the magnitude, and it always points in the phi hat direction, okay? One part done. Now, again, we have to figure out what this capital R vector here, remember, the capital R vector points from a point on the source to the point at which you would like to know the field, the field point right here, from the source to the field point, okay? Um, in order to write that little vector, um, we're going to say, okay, this point here, the field point, is at uh, 0, 0, H, or H, Z hat. All right, that's a vector describing this field point P right here. Okay, and the vector describing um, this point right here, this point right here, a particular point on the circle, is just equal to rho in the rho hat direction. So this uh, vector pointing from P to that point is equal to h z hat minus rho rho hat. Now we know this uh, expression. We have an expression for the differential length and we have an expression for uh, capital R. 
Now we need to go ahead and figure out, okay, what is DL cross R hat, okay, or DL cross R. Um, this is one where you need to look up the cross product in cylindrical coordinates. You, you need to do that. I, I have suppressed the details here, but when you, if you go look up the um, expressions for the cross product in cylindrical coordinates and apply it to this DL and this R, uh, this is the expression that, that uh, results right here. And I'd encourage you to do that as an exercise. So DL cross capital R in this case is rho h d phi in the rho hat direction. So there's a component in the rho hat direction. And um, plus rho squared d phi, all right, in the z hat direction, all right. So we have a, uh, a component in the rho hat direction pointing radially out. So this, I should say radially, uh, yeah, radially out, outwards. Um, so this little differential uh, um, current element contributes a uh, contributes a little differential uh, magnetic field here that points both in this direction and in this direction. That's what this that's what this picture is showing you. This differential current element creates a differential magnetic field that has a component along that direction and along that direction. This, cor this uh, component corresponds to this term right here. This component corresponds to this term right there. Okay, the next step in order to find the total field, the total field H, is we have to integrate over the entire surface here of our, uh, of our object, all, all the way around our filamentary loop, essentially. So when you uh, substitute all of this stuff into this expression, recognizing here again that uh, in this case that um, the magnitude of this uh, vector r is going to be the square root of h squared plus rho squared in this case. That's where this term comes from. You end up with uh, an expression for dh that looks like this. Again, it's got a component along the rho direction and a component along the z direction. However, if you think about this, um, <clears throat> if you uh, uh, because of because of symmetry, if you look at this particular geometry that we have, I think you can convince yourself that uh, the contribution uh, in the row direction due to this filamentary uh, current element is going to be equal and opposite to uh, the uh, differential magnetic field contribution due to a, a uh, filamentary current element on the opposite side, 180 degrees away on the circle. So each of these, these pairs of uh, differential current elements is going to cancel each other out essentially. So by symmetry, the rho hat comp, uh, component of H is, is equal to zero. As we integrate all the way around this, we just simply say, by symmetry, that part is going to be equal to zero. However, a differential current element at this point contributes the same amount to the magnetic field uh, and in the same direction as a uh, little current element at 180 degrees away. So all of those, all of those little differential current elements add up con constructively. And so there is a component in the Z direction of the magnetic field right here along the axis. So if we simply take um, the product of this term and this term and integrate it uh, from phi going from e zero to two pi radians, um, we end up with uh, this integrand right here. And if you go ahead and carry out this integral, um, you'll see that you get a factor of two pi from this d phi. This isn't a, a function of phi, that's not a function of phi, that's not a function of phi. So none of, any, none of this stuff is a function of phi. So that all we can just simply pull out of the integral. And all we have to do is integrate d, free, d phi from zero to two pi. That's just a factor of two pi. And so the final expression here is um, two pi over four pi is just one half. And so we end up with capital I rho squared over two rho squared plus h squared to the three halves power in the z hat direction. So um, 
on the axis here, on the axis, the direction of the magnetic field always points along the z direction, all right? And interestingly also, uh, the magnitude of uh, the field along the axis falls off as well. Um, you've got a factor of rho squared here uh, in the numerator, and in the uh, denominator, you have a factor of uh, rho squared plus uh, h squared to the 3 halves power, okay? So um, as you get away, as you, as you go away from the um, plane of the loop, the magnitude of the magnetic field is, is going to uh, decrease, okay? It's gonna decrease. Um, but not all that quickly, not all that quickly. What you're seeing here in the second of, uh, of these two figures is they're showing you the field lines for the, for the magnetic field at places other than just on the axis of the loop. So here you can see we're on the axis of the loop and in fact the magnetic field is always directed straight up in the z direction. But as soon as you move off of as soon as you move off of the um, axis, you can see that uh, the magnetic field lines start to bend, and they in fact uh, form loops in this direction, just like that, um, surrounding uh, the current uh, current element. We'll see a little bit more of, of how this sort of thing works when we study uh, Ampere's law. Well, thank you uh, very much for your attention. Uh, that concludes this lecture and I'll see you next time.